let's get started. It's five past three nearly. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's seminar in which we have the opportunity to preview the new online training resources for frontline practice leadership. It's kind of an exciting day because we'll see some lovely new resources as well as look at the evidence behind this work. First, Chris will give us an overview of the research that sits behind this about the nature and significance of frontline practice leadership in intellectual disability services. This evidence is based on a scoping review that was completed of the literature, which you won't be surprised to hear that much of that literature, in fact, 14 out of the 23 papers that were included, stems from the work of Chris and the team at the Living with Disability Research Centre, and also the collaboration with Jim Mansell and Julie Beadle-Brown from the Tizard Centre in, in Kent. Following that look at the, at the research, we'll then move on to, to Dr Lincoln Humphreys, and Lincoln will walk us through the modules in the new online training program developed by the Identifying Quality team at LIDS. The resources were funded by the NDIS Quality and Safeguard Commission and filmed in collaboration with Unison Disability Services and Maytree. We just managed um, to finish this as the lockdown happened. So the resources have been um, a long time coming in many ways. So welcome to you all. And just to let you know that when you have questions, we'd like you to put them into the Q&A, not into the chat box. And then we'll address those questions, um, firstly, um, with a break after Chris, and then move on to Lincoln and leave plenty of time also for questions at the end of the seminar. So welcome to you, Chris, and I'll hand over. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to, as Jacinta said, provide you with a review of the evidence uh, that sits behind uh, frontline practice leadership and the resources uh, that, that we've developed. So I'm going to talk for maybe 20 minutes about some of this evidence, just to, so you can see the context uh, in which this work that Lincoln's then going to illustrate, the context in which it sits. So I'm going to talk a bit about the, the evidence about the significance of, first of all, frontline management and then frontline practice leadership and uh, its significance to the quality of supported accommodation services and to staff who work in them. I'm going to talk a bit about the tasks and the ways of organising frontline practice leadership. What do we know about the strength of frontline practice leadership? And lastly, some of the challenges that currently uh, confront people in services in terms of, of embedding practice leadership in their services. So if you look back in time, there's a lot of theoretical literature from management clearly about the significance of frontline management to the quality of services, all types of services in health and community care. Um, but there is a specific strand of literature about the significance of frontline management to the quality of services for people with intellectual disabilities. So the first set of literature doesn't talk about practice leadership in particular, it talks about this broader concept of, of the role of the frontline manager. Um, and there's a theme that suggests that the role of the frontline manager is very important in terms of the quality of services for people with intellectual disability. So as early as the, the, 19, the beginning of the 1970s, there was work done in the UK by King, Tizard and Raines, a whole body of work, which was looking at the early uh, hostels and small homes that were set up for children with intellectual disabilities who had moved out of institutions. And they were comparing some of those early, uh, early services with the institutions but what they were able to identify was that even within those early group homes and hostels there were there were quite different types of 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 practice that was happening there were practices that were child orientated and there were practices that were still institutionally orientated even though they were in newer smaller accommodation services and Part of the conclusion of one of their studies 
was that they pointed overwhelmingly to the importance of the role of the head of the living unit in setting the pattern of care for the ward in which a child lived or from the hostel in which they lived. So they identified at that time, there was more than just the design of the home or the institution where the person lived, it was the role of the frontline manager who set the pattern of the type of care that was provided. And following that in the US, there was a, a, a series of studies again in, which was in the early 1980s, which were looking at some of the newer group homes and studied uh, the role of staff and the role of managers in setting the quality of those group homes. So they did the initial very early study about the competencies of managers of group homes. And their conclusion was that the competence of the manager in normalization practice, and that meant in the, the values and the orientation of the manager, was the largest independent predictor of the satisfaction of, with the placement by the people with intellectual disabilities themselves and the extent to which people living in those services were included in community-based activities. So again, the role of the manager was really important in terms of predicting what the quality of those homes would be and the outcomes for the people who lived it with them. And that was followed up later on in the US in the early 2000s uh, by Hewitt and Larson, who did a lot of work in Minnesota about the competencies of direct support professionals and frontline supervisors. And their conclusion in 2005 was, it's the frontline supervisor who defines the job, provides the training, mediates the stresses, creates the culture, helps people find personally satisfying rewards of direct support work, and establishes a well-functioning work environment. So way back from the 1970s, there's, there's, been, there's been a body of work that suggests frontline managers um, in intellectual disability services are really important in setting uh, the norms and the practice that happens in a service. In 2004 and then a follow-up in 2007, Hewitt and Larson and their colleagues did a, a job analysis of the competencies uh, that you need in order to be a frontline manager or a house supervisor in a small group home. And it was a very long, complex study that they did, but it was a very thorough study. And they found that there was 142 competencies that were required of frontline supervisors, that it was a very complex and demanding position. And it covered these 14 domains, which were very different areas of, of, of work, which spanned from doing general office work to doing direct support work, to managing finances, managing payrolls, managing HR, um, managing personnel. So you can see the span of competencies that were required. In 2007, Tim Clement and I, as part of our work, um, Making Life Good in the Community, which was about the deinstitutionalization of Q, we replicated uh, the work that had been done in the US and refined those US competencies in the context of, at that time, the Victorian Department of Community Services and the role of their house supervisors. And we ended up with 141 competencies. So one was dropped, uh, which was essentially about developing behavior support plans. We uh, took out 11, added in 10, um, and kept the same 14 domains. So you can see that the domains where Victorian house supervisors uh, had to cover were very similar to those in the US. And that's just, um, you could, the slides will be available afterwards, just some examples of some of the competencies that sit under each of those um, broad headings. So, but what these two studies showed us was that how supervisors of group homes were actually managers rather than practice leaders. So part of the study that we did uh, for the people that were moving out of Q and in those Q group homes was to do a time log study of how house supervisors spent their time. And what was very clear from that study was that their workload was, was really poorly balanced. So most of them spent on average 43% of their time doing direct support work. 
being part of the roster. Um, they spent actually a very small proportion of their time with uh, and a small proportion of the competencies with tasks that were associated with leading and improving practice. So they spent 3% of their entire time facilitating staff meetings and less than 1% conducting formal supervision with staff. And because they worked on the roster, they didn't actually get to work alongside all of the staff who they were responsible for supervising. Because often there was only one or two people in the house and because they were on the roster, they only worked alongside particular staff. And they almost never saw the staff who worked at night or on a different part of the roster to them. Because they were also working on the roster, there were very few opportunities for them to observe the work of other staff and provide feedback. So they, if there's two people in a house, they might be working with people uh, doing personal care, while the other worker might be working with, with people cooking breakfast in the kitchen. So there was no opportunity for those house supervisors to actually just observe and provide feedback on what the other staff member might be doing which meant that some staff actually had no guidance at all to the type of practice that they were doing. And also at that time, because of the way the house supervisor position was, uh, was organized and because of the way those houses were organized, staff weren't, uh, had, some staff had very few opportunities to either be supervised or to actually attend meetings. So the role of the house supervisor, even though technically, uh, according to the competencies, it included work about being a practice leader. Only a very small fraction of their time was spent doing those sorts of practice leadership tasks. So as a result of some of that work and sort of in, in parallel almost with what was happening in Australia and, and in the US, um, Jim Mansell and Judy, Julie Beadle-Brown were doing work in the UK that was focusing on um, ideas about frontline practice leadership within the context of trying to understand how to embed good active support in group homes and to understand what were the determinants of quality of life for people living in group homes. So they established quite early on that um, active support was associated with good outcomes and then they were trying to find out as we followed on many years later what's associated with good active support and they begin they began to hypothesize that um, frontline practice leadership was important so they began to investigate frontline practice leadership as a subset of tasks of frontline management so they began to divide frontline management into a subset of things that were frontline practice leadership and they identified um, in their training work in 2004, the five domains of practice leadership that they suggested were about providing skilled guidance and motivation for staff to provide good practice. And the diagram here that Lincoln's going to talk much more about later on just sets out those five domains of frontline practice leadership, focusing staff attention on the quality of life, observing staff practice, giving feedback, coaching staff and modelling good practice, facilitating teamwork and team meetings, supervising the practice of each staff member and allocating and organising staff support on every shift. And then somewhat later, um, Devro and McGill, who, who did, who've been doing work on frontline practice leadership, primarily in um, services where people have quite severe challenge in behaviour, they began to talk about practice leadership as a particular style of management that was developed um, around, that was aimed to develop staff practice. And, and they talked about it as being more akin to leadership, about exercising influence over uh, what was happening in a home, rather than management, which is much more about more mundane monitoring and implementing procedures and processes. And Devereaux suggests that uh, frontline practice leadership has two aspects to it, that it, it's got formal aspects, which are things like having formal meetings, uh, formal supervision, and there's informal aspects too, 
which are the sort of informal supervision or informal feedback that happens along the way. So I think that's quite a good way of thinking about these five domains, that some of them are formal and some of them are informal. And the best type of practice leadership is where formal and informal are working alongside together. So we Mansell defined what practice leadership was, those five domains, and uh, put forward a proposition that when managerial practices incorporate good practice leadership, it leads to better quality of life outcomes for the people who are being supported in group homes. And in 2000, and, uh, we did a, a Julie Beadle Brown and I published a paper in 2018 which reviewed all the evidence about what makes a difference to the quality of life in group homes up until 2014. And at that time, we concluded that the evidence about the significance of frontline practice leadership was beginning to emerge. And at that time, the strongest evidence suggested that where there were higher levels of active support, there were also higher levels of practice leadership. But it was practice leadership that was combined also with good management practices. And that was, came from a study that was using a self-reported measure of frontline practice leadership, where staff reported on how much they felt they were receiving practice leadership. And since that time, there's been uh, progressive findings published from the Australian, from our longitudinal study of the predictors of active support. But we've been using an observational measure uh, that was developed uh, by Julie in collaboration with us and then tested on our Australian data uh, to, to analyze and to judge the strength of frontline practice leadership. So in the paper in 2015 about that measure, there was found to be a significant relationship between higher levels of practice leadership and levels of active support. And in um, our 2019 and 20 papers, we were very, very clear that the strength of practice leadership at the service level, the level of the house, was a predictor of good active support. And that was a predictor in combination with staff having training in active support, staff having confidence um, in their management and uh, having, a, having a design which was a small group home at no more than, than six people in the home. And what we found is whatever combination of data you used, whether it was the cross-sectional data or whether it was the longitudinal data, practice leadership came out as an important predictor of the quality of practice and therefore the quality of life outcomes for people living in group homes. What we've also found is that frontline practice leadership is, is significantly associated with staff culture. So there's aspects of frontline practice leadership appear to be important in generating the type of service culture that is associated with better outcomes for people living in group homes. So in the early ethnographic work that we did, we found that the culture in better group homes were characterized by strong leadership and a shared responsibility among staff for the quality of practice. So there was strong practice leadership happening and that was generating a shared responsibility amongst staff to monitor each other about the quality of practice. And in the later work um, in Lincoln, Lincoln's PhD, which developed the group home culture scale, he found that when staff perceive that the service culture has an effective team leader, where there's effective team leadership, there are better outcomes for the people being supported in terms of engagement. So practice leadership not only impacts directly on practice, it indirectly also impacts on culture that is associated with, with better performing houses and better outcomes for the people living in those services. And there's some relatively new work which is beginning to uh, frame this idea around capable environments, talking about um, positive behaviour support. And there's a sense, this is coming from Horn and people in the US, UK, who are suggesting that practice leadership is an important component to build capable environments that are able to implement positive behaviour support strategies. There's also uh, not a strong, but there's emerging evidence about the significance of frontline practice leadership 
to star and to staff attitudes. So practice leadership is associated with positive staff experience and greater staff satisfaction uh, for, for staff who work in services where there's people who have challenging behaviour. So having strong practice leadership actually helps staff to feel more positive about their work. And um, it's clear from some of the recent work that Jade McEwen's doing is that staff in day services perceive that uh, having collaborative hands-on practice leadership is actually a key aspect of the quality of service. Uh, and that's, that's what they value uh, in terms of, of the day services, day services that they worked in. And uh, there's a recent paper 2015 from Hutchinson and Sturford Krauss, which suggests that working in a team with clear leadership and guidance is seen to be very important from the perspectives of support workers in group homes. So there's, there's this emerging evidence that if you have strong frontline practice leadership, it not only produces better outcomes for the people that are being supported, but it produces a better culture and it produces greater satisfaction from the staff who are working in those services. And that in the long run will reduce turnover of staff, which is a, a major issue in many services and means that services haven't got to recruit and keep recruiting staff. So I just want to turn now to the organization of frontline practice leadership. So traditionally in many of this early research, it's been uh, the frontline practice leader has been uh, considered to be the house supervisor. So there's been one house supervisor working in one service who works approximately 50% of the time on the roster and the rest of the time doing practice leadership tasks. And as our work in the early 2000s showed, they often had very little time to spend on those practice leadership tasks. But since uh, 2009, there's been these emerging different models of frontline management and frontline practice leadership. What we've seen is that the administration work, the office work has become sometimes consolidated and moved to a more central regional manager or a central admin hub within an organization. That how supervisors are often expected to do less direct support work, but at the same time to have a greater span of responsibility. So instead of having one house supervisor per house, you may have a team leader who works across two houses or even three houses. And uh, which means that some of the tasks have been split off from the, that original set of competencies of frontline supervisors. So when we did our analysis uh, in 2018 of, of our longitudinal data set, we found that among the 14 organisations that were part of the study, we actually had eight different models of organising frontline practice leadership. They had different spans, and in some instances, those five domains or tasks of frontline practice leadership were split between different positions. They may be taken by a team manager who might have responsibility for coaching and feedback, but it may be a more senior manager who has a greater responsibility across more houses who manages the team or, and chairs meetings. So there's different iterations of how these five tasks are split between different positions. But what our data showed is that there's two aspects of the organization of frontline practice leadership that are really important to consider. That they need the frontline practice leadership roles, those five tasks, need to be conducted and need to be done by people who are close to the staff, uh, that they're providing feedback and that they're, they're managing, and close and who know the people that are being supported by those staff. They also need to have credibility, so they need to be uh, skilled practitioners and they need to know the staff and the staff need to have confidence in them that they are skilled practitioners who can give that feedback. And there needs to be opportunities, and this is the informal versus the formal, for incidental uh, observing as well as more formal uh, observing, coaching and feedback. So ideally, uh, frontline practice leadership does need to be consolidated rather than split across positions and it needs to be aligned with the sort of authority that the frontline manager has. 
So in many ways, Mansell's concept that frontline practice leadership is a subset of frontline management tasks is probably a, a good way to, of thinking about how frontline practice leadership needs to be organised. There's some interesting data that we have about the strength of frontline practice leadership. So our early Australian uh, data and what we published in 2019 was based on um, analysis that was actually a few years before that, which suggested that uh, frontline practice leadership was relatively weak, but it was improving, and that the strongest domain was, was uh, running uh, staff meetings, and that the weakest was around coaching and supervision. And what we found in, in, in the earlier study and what a similar, another study by Wooderson has found is that few frontline practice leaders actually have any specific training in being practice leaders. They tend to be people who are good practitioners, direct support workers who get promoted into being a frontline manager or practice leader and, and, and they don't have much training about how to do it. It's just assumed that they'll, they'll be able to fit in and work it out for themselves. And the UK um, data, which uh, suggests that there is potential though um, to improve the quality of frontline practice leadership if you focus on it. Um, but the more recent research suggests that many of the frontline managers who have practice leadership roles lack time or skill to really act as frontline practice leaders. And in the UK, the role is being challenged um, by the austerity and the cuts that are happening to service there so that frontline practice leaders are spending less time in services. They're having to manage uh, more than two services, often three or four, and they're getting reduced support from senior managers. So the frontline practice leadership positions are being really squeezed uh, in the UK according to that recent data. This is just some data from, from our longitudinal study, which I think demonstrates two things. It demonstrates that at baseline, which was the first year um, of eight years worth of data collection, uh, the overall score on our practice leadership measure was very low. So the average score was 2.35 out of five. And the proportion of services that had good or excellent um, practice leadership was 3%. But by the eighth year of the study, the average score had risen to 3.37 out of five and 30% of, uh, of services had a good or excellent practice leadership. So I think that's an indication that with attention and with good training and good support from senior managers, you can increase the quality of practice leadership that's happening in services. And that's just a really nice sort of uh, illustration of how you can go from a very low baseline and how you can improve the quality of practice leadership over time with attention. The final piece of evidence um, is about the orientation and the perceptions of frontline practice leaders themselves. So as part of the study that we did in the queue, uh, people moving out of queue, we talk to uh, what we called an extreme sample of house supervisors, who were people that um, managers selected as being the best house supervisors. And uh, more than one person uh, identified each of the people in our study as being a really good house supervisor. So what we were able to do was to identify the sort of orientations that good house supervisors had towards their work and therefore the type of people that make good house supervisors. And the first element was about passion and vocation. So the people that were these good house supervisors were really passionate about their role and wanted to do this role. They weren't on their way to something else. So as one of them said, I don't think there's been a day in 20 years that I've been unhappy to go to work. Every shift is there was one thing that I can do to make even the smallest difference that might be assisting someone to have an excellent shower, the best shower, then that's really the best shower, then that's really exciting to me. So this person, and 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 this is just an illustration of almost all of the people said these very similar things about how much they enjoyed their work, they enjoyed making the difference at this level, and they didn't want to go and be more senior managers. They had stamina 
and they had flexibility. So there were people that could, as this one says, change their hat all day long. They could move from doing one task to doing something else and they were calm. They could deal with whatever happened, with the unpredictability of being at the front line and not quite knowing what was gonna happen that day. They were people that could tolerate uncertainty and they certainly liked to, to do things and to lead, to be leaders of, of what was happening. And as one said, I've got this great opportunity to be doing it the way I'd always thought I'd like to be able to do it. I like to make things happen. And they also were very clear that they enjoyed the sort of work-life balance. They got a great deal of, great, of satisfaction from their work and they enjoyed working flexible hours. So these weren't people that wanted to work nine to five and couldn't deal, and, and they weren't routinized, routine based people. They were people that could, could be flexible and go with the flow of what's happening. Um, and then some more recent work by Devro and McGill suggests that uh, frontline practice leaders uh, recognize the significance of personal observation, of, of being in a service and watching what's happening and of having contact with their staff, which they see as a, a very important component of this job. So there's a particular sort of set of, of orientations and characteristics uh, that, that form the basis of, of skilled frontline practice leaders. And just finally, and we're gonna move on to uh, some of, consider some of this, but it's very clear from the literature over this period of time that there's a number of obstacles uh, to having strong frontline practice leadership um, that need to be addressed. And I guess in terms of the training materials that we're going to talk about today, uh, that's one way in which uh, us as researchers have begun to try and address these issues by, uh, by building an understanding of the knowledge and skills that are required and of building training so that training is more available to the people who occupy these frontline practice leader positions. But what's clear is there's also challenges um, and there's been challenges right back from the 1970s in terms of the time that's allocated to frontline practice leadership, in terms of the way frontline practice leadership is structured within organisations. And at the current time, uh, I'm aware there's a number of significant uh, question marks happening about funding uh, for these tasks of frontline practice leadership. Um, there's often a high turnover of staff in these positions. Um, often in big organizations, people who are good frontline practice leaders, leaders get moved from house to house to put out uh, fires. And that creates sort of uncertainty back in the houses where they've been working. And one of the things that we know is it's very important to have support for frontline practice leaders from senior leaders in organizations. And increasingly what we seem to be seeing is uh, a sort of move away from understanding of practice at that level of senior executives within organisations who are coming in from other sectors who don't necessarily understand the significance of practice in intellectual disability services and therefore the significance of practice leadership and providing support for practice leaders to do their role. So I'm going to stop there. There's a list of all the references if anybody's interested in following them up. We've, we've probably got time just into, to take a couple of questions if there are any questions, otherwise we can move on. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris. That was, that was really excellent and gives such a good background to this whole area, particularly from the point of view of then looking at training. Graham Furman has a question. All right, Graham asks, was there any research done or data collected around placement centres? Okay, so the vast majority of this work has been done in relation to uh, shared supported accommodation services. Some of the work from the Vermont studies in the US also included um, vocational employment services. And we're now just beginning to collect data uh, from some day support programs. And the work from Jade McEwen came from day programs as well. So it, it's not a lot around day programs, but we're just moving into, into that space. And there's no reason to think that, that it should be any different in those, those services. Okay, we have another question. 
from Coral Far this time. Coral says, do you think that the culture of learning and embracing new ways of practice influences quality of service? <laughs> well, yes, but I think, I think it's also about what it is that you're learning and what it is that you're embracing. And I think our position is that you need to, you need to embrace evidence-based practice. Um, and learn and develop skills around that. And that there is now growing evidence about active support as a fundamental person-centered practice that's based on evidence and on practice leadership. So yes, Coral. Yes. Um, one more question. Um, that's the third one up here. And we might stop after this one, but keep adding them and we'll come back to them after Lincoln's presentation. Diane Hardy asks, can you tell us about any research comparing frontline supervision with other sectors? No, um, <laughs> in short, what I can tell you is that the other sectors, um, particularly in health and broader community care, have evidence about the significance of, of supervision, the significance of uh, coaching for practice, but there's very few other sectors where there's research done about frontline practice leadership for basically uh, you know non-tertiary trained staff so this work is done in the context of intellectual disability services and practice leadership of direct support workers who don't have tertiary education who aren't professionals uh, in that in that sense most of the work that's been done um, has been about frontline leadership and practice leadership of professional staff in health and community services. So this is sort of coming at it from a different angle, but certainly it's what we find and the elements of practice leadership are reflected in those other sectors. Hope that helps a bit. So our second presentation today is being given by Dr. Lincoln Humphreys. And Lincoln is a lecturer in disability studies in our um, postgraduate disability studies program here at, at La Trobe University and he's also a research fellow in the Living with Disability Research Centre. So it's really nice to, to see you here today um, Lincoln and to welcome you to talk about frontline practice leadership training res about the training resource itself. So over to you. Thanks Jacinta and thank you all for letting me present today on the new resource on frontline practice leadership. So this resource was developed from the knowledge gained from the research conducted in the longitudinal study into practice leadership. So we gathered about seven years worth of evidence about what good practice leadership looks like. And then we've also over the years uh, delivered training in practice leadership. So this training resource sort of represents what we've learned from the research and delivering this training. Um, so as Jacinta said at the beginning, this resource has been a long time in the making. I feel like last year, there were many conversations and many emails with people where we were saying it's coming, it's coming. And so I'm pleased to finally say it's here and it's up on the internet and it's accessible. Um, so in my presentation today, I'm going to preview just some of the material that's in this training resource. So just about the resource before I start showing um, any clips and things like that. So this resource is designed for frontline supervisors, service managers and experienced support workers. So it's really for staff who are already doing practice leadership, staff that manage practice leaders, or support workers who are aspiring to step up into the role of practice leadership. So as Chris said in her presentation, um, for people who work as yes, supervisors and services, there's not a great deal of training available um, in how to perform their role. I know from when I worked in services, there was no training available in terms of uh, how to manage a service and how to manage staff. Uh, so this training resource, to some extent, tries to fill that void in showing and explaining very much how to do practice leadership, how to be a leader of staff. So there are six modules in this training resource that teach how to do the five tasks of practice leadership. Um, and there's several different learning uh, material on the website. So there's videos that introduce each of the five tasks and explain what they're about. 
Um, there are active scenarios. So these are actors that play the roles of uh, frontline practice leaders and support, uh, support staff. We have interviews with real practice leaders who talk about their experience of um, doing practice leadership. And there's also clips of real support of support workers providing support to people in services. Um, other learning material on the resource are written text and diagrams that explain key ideas. And to enhance learning, there are activities um, throughout the modules and there's a workbook um, for people to complete. So there are different, the resource can be used in different ways as learning methods. So uh, staff can work through it on their own by going through the modules in order. They could work through it with colleagues, um, you know, together in team meetings, for instance, they could work through the material and uh, discuss the questions and discuss the videos. It's also designed so that trainers uh, can deliver training to a large group of people. They can take the material that's on the website and there's going to be some slides that will be available uh, for trainers to, to deliver uh, training in frontline practice leadership. So what I'm going to do is present material about each of the five tasks of practice leadership. So the first task is focusing staff attention on quality of lives. So this is about ensuring the primary focus of the service and staff is on the quality of life of the people you support. So enhancing quality of life is obviously an important concept within the field of disability services. It's central to disability policy, uh, service delivery. So many organizations will explicitly or implicitly say that quality of life is um, you know, the purpose of this service, it's in their values, and it's uh, the focus of practice leadership. So to perform this first task, frontline practice leaders need to know what is quality of life. It's a broad concept, it's an abstract concept, um, but in essence, it's about what it means to live a good life. So in an attempt to add some meaning to what is quality of life and really distill what it looks like and what it's about, uh, we made a video and I'm going to present that video which introduces quality of life and explains why it is important. What is quality of life? Quality of life is an important concept. It's about what it means to live a good life. Enhancing quality of life is a common goal of disability policies and services. Quality of life has been conceptualized as having eight domains or falling into eight broad areas of life. All eight domains are applicable to everyone, to people with and without intellectual disabilities. The domains are interpersonal relationships, emotional well-being, personal development, physical well-being, self-determination, social inclusion, rights, and material well-being. In each of the domains, there are indicators. Indicators provide a guide of what to look for or focus on if you're a support worker or practice leader. For example, indicators of interpersonal relationships are how many friends a person has, and the quality of those relationships. An indicator of social inclusion is a person's participation in their community or use of community facilities, like being a member of a footy club or going to shops, the library and sports facilities. Indicators of self-determination include making decisions and choices, such as where a person lives, with whom, and what happens on a daily basis. Indicators of material well-being include a person's income and possessions. There are many indicators in each of the domains. Choosing the ones that matter to each individual is important. It's also important to remember that engagement underpins each of the domains. For instance, to have friends, you have to engage with people. There are key principles to keep in mind when thinking about quality of life. It is individual. What a good quality of life looks like is different for each person. We each value different things. 
What we value and consider to be a good life can change over time and through experiences. Quality of life is both subjective and objective. Objective quality of life refers to objective factors, like a person's income and how many friends a person has. Subjective quality of life refers to a person's perception of their own life and what is important to them, such as how happy they are about their friendships. Quality of life is influenced by factors external to the person, such as the quality of support a person receives from staff. There are benefits to understanding and applying a quality of life framework. It helps to focus on each individual and what is important to them. It helps to evaluate how well a service is supporting a person to live a good life. And it helps in identifying how a person's quality of life can be enhanced. Okay, so in that video, it introduces and explains some of the key elements of quality of life. Um, in particular, so it demonstrates, you know, what are the eight domains and some of the indicators. But what I want to focus on in this presentation is how knowledge of quality of life can be used by practice leaders. Um, so the eight domains and their indicators can be used to guide thinking about each person supported. So the idea is that with each person um, that a staff team and individual supports, you can ask questions like, how good is their quality of life? So asking that question, you can draw on the eight domains to do that. For instance, you could ask, how good is their quality of life in terms of their interpersonal relations? You know, the quality of the relationships they have with people, how many people they are in contact with, um, and uh, you know, what do they get out of those interactions? Uh, social inclusion, so how good is their quality of life uh, in terms of the things they do in the community, uh, the people that, um, that they're in contact with, and things like material well-being as well. So the idea is that by understanding quality of life in the eight domains, you can take this abstract concept and use it to think about each person that you support. And then after considering their quality of life, to start thinking about the, the support. Um, so asking how well is the service supporting their quality of life? So by using those two key questions, you can start to identify and think very sort of concretely what's important to this person and how well is this service supporting their quality of life. Um, so on the website, there's two more videos. Um, well, there's two videos which show quality of life about two people, Michael and Jared, who both live good lives. So I encourage you to uh, check out those videos on the website. Uh, Michael is a person with either a severe or profound intellectual disability and demonstrates what brings meaning into his life. And for Jared, uh, another, there's another video which sort of demonstrates what brings meaning to his life as well. So the idea is that you can take uh, the idea of quality of life and see what it looks like for each individual. So what I want to focus on is how practice leaders can help staff to focus on quality of life and the connection between support and quality of life. So we know from researching to active support, when staff provide good active support, the people they experience, the people they support experience higher levels of engagement. So staff support is a key influence on the quality of life of people with intellectual disabilities. Every day support workers can make an impact on a person's quality of life. So the role of the frontline practice leader is to help staff understand that the support they provide makes a real difference to a person's quality of life. But the question is, how can practice leaders do this? So in the next video, uh, it demonstrates how a practice leader can help a support worker understand the purpose of their role and see a person's potential. Here you go, Marie. Here's a magazine for you. How are you going, Marie?
finished with that magazine? Here's another one to look at. Hey Sophie, how's the afternoon going? Pretty good. I've gone on top of some paperwork and the washing's done. Oh good. Um, how's Marie's afternoon going? How do you think that's going for her? Yeah, she's been keeping herself busy reading her magazines. Okay, so I've noticed that she's been turning the pages for the last 30 minutes and she kind of keeps looking around to see where you are. I'm wondering how much <coughs> is she really enjoying it and is there something else that she likes to do? Well, people don't want to do things all the time. I mean, when I get home, I like to sit down and relax. Yeah, I agree. However, I think that Marie probably spends a lot of her time flicking through magazines. You know, how meaningful is that for her? I just think it's really important we keep asking ourselves the question, how well are we doing this? You know, what, what's her quality of life and how can we support her better? I suppose Marie does spend a lot of her time reading through magazines and she doesn't do much when she's at home. But I don't know what else to do. Okay, so why don't we work through it together? Uh, let's use the four essentials of active support. If we look at um, every moment has potential, how could we apply that? I suppose I could involve Marie in what I'm doing. I could um, check in with her and see if she's happy to fold some washing. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And I was also thinking that, you know, you could sit with her and read the magazine together or have a chat. One of the other essentials is maximising choice and control. So how Marie is offered choices and makes them. So instead of offering her, you know, one choice like a magazine, perhaps you could give her two or three options to choose from. Sure, I can try that this afternoon. Great, thank you, Sophie. Can I join you, Marie? Okay, so what I want to do now is unpack what happened in that video. Um, so for anyone that's worked in services, this scenario might resonate with you. Um, so this scenario is about how to have a difficult conversation with a staff member based on what you have seen. Um, from my experience in delivering training in practice leadership, um, this is something that supervisors do struggle a bit, that they, you know, when they're in the service, they do see some uh, certain practices or things that are happening, uh, which they know should be otherwise, but just have some difficulty uh, engaging in that conversation. So this, this video is, um, in some ways, is trying to demonstrate how to do that in a sort of uh, positive and constructive way. So the aspect that the practice leader um, had to sort of bring up and discuss in this video was that the support worker actually believed she was performing her role well. Um, you know, she, to her, the, the role of the support worker was about completing house chores and administration tasks and keeping Marie occupied, which is what she had done in the scenario. Um, but, you know, for the frontline practice leader, um, she identified that this the way in which the support worker was working wasn't effectively contributing to uh, Marie's quality of life, um, that this needed to be addressed. Uh, like, as, as, a, as I said before, that um, support workers have the potential every day to influence the quality of life of the people they support. Um, so in this conversation, the practice leader had to address this thinking or, or shift the support worker's thinking and in in her beliefs. So how she did that, the practice leader, was to ask those questions which I showed before is about quality of life, to ask how meaningful is that and what is her quality of life and how can we support her better? So the practice leader in bringing that up sort of really brings it down to, you know, about Marie and what she's doing in the moment and then to think more generally about her quality of life and raising the question about how meaningful is it that um, she spends a lot of her time flicking through magazines. The other thing that the frontline practice leader did was help the support worker to think about what engagement and quality of life looks like for Marie. Um, and by bringing up that conversation and asking those questions, it helped the um, support worker to realise that 
Marie does spend a lot of time flipping through magazines and brought out that the support worker who doesn't know what else to do to support um, Marie better so that she is engaged in more meaningful activities. So then the practice leader helped the support worker to recognise other opportunities for engagement. So they applied some of the four essentials of active support to stimulate thinking. So the practice leader asked about how she could apply every moment has potential and to also provide choices to Marie so that she has choice and control. And then in addition, towards the end, the practice leader provided suggestions for other activities. So the practice leader was using her own knowledge and expertise about what engagement looks like for Murray and other aspects, uh, sorry, in other ways she could be experiencing quality of life. So um, that's the first task of practice leadership, which is about focusing staff attention on quality of life. So what I want to do now is focus on the other tasks and these can also be used to help staff focus on quality of life and support that enhances it. So the next task of practice leadership is organising, as allocating and organising staff support. So frontline practice leaders organise and support staff to work individually and as a team. So this helps staff support, this helps ensure staff support is provided when and how each person you support wants and needs it. And that there's consistency across staff in the way they work and provide support. So off the tasks of practice leadership, this is probably the one um, that needs a bit more explanation. Um, so allocating and organising staff support really comprises three key elements. It's about um, having shift plans that staff plan before and during shifts and that staff plan with the people they support. So it's about staff being organised so they're providing support in accordance with each person's needs and wants. So um, shift plans are often used and commonly found in um, group homes and other supported accommodation services. So these capture information about the regular patterns of activities and behaviour in a service. So for instance, shift plans um, should be written for every day of the week. So, you know, Monday through to Friday and Saturday and Sunday, and they should cover what happens in the mornings and the afternoons and the evenings. Um, so these cover the regular patterns of activities of the people who live in that service. So for instance, what time people usually wake up in the morning, uh, what they usually do once they get up, and then the support they need to sort of um, perform the regular activities of their day. So the purpose of shift plans is to help staff know what to do on shift and how to do it. Um, so for instance, if there's casuals or other sort of irregular staff that work in the service, that they know what's going to happen on, on shift and so they know what to do and how to support the people in accordance with their needs and wants. But it's also useful for other more permanent staff so they can sort of, um, you know, remind themselves of what's going to happen for the shift or if they work a shift which um, they don't normally do. So they sort of understand what's going to happen on that shift. So on the website, we've provided examples of shift plans or templates that can be used, um, to, you know, to develop shift plans. And we provide some guidance on what to include and how to develop them. So in terms of staff planning before and during shifts, so what this looks like is that when staff begin their shift, they work out the key activities that are going to happen and who will be responsible for them. So if there's two staff working together, this would look like that each, you know, both staff are meeting together and having a discussion about what's going to happen on that shift and who will be responsible for those activities. Or if a staff member is working independently, again, it would be about them working out what's going to happen. So they've got a bit of a plan in terms of how the shift's going to evolve. And finally, the third element is about planning with the people they support. So, you know, finding out what the people they support want to do and plan their day with them. You know, this could be sitting and having a conversation with them, or there might be other plans that have been generated, you know, pictured plans or things like that. So the people know what's going to happen. Okay, so I'm going to show another video now. This is what happens when the key elements of allocating and organising staff are not in place. Last card. Hey guys, should we start cooking dinner now? Yep. Great, into the kitchen. What's for dinner? Spaghetti bolognese. We'll start with celery, there you go, and some carrots. 
four is enough. Hey, Julie, do you want to wash the vegetables? Simon, can you get the chopping boards, please? Okay, there's your knife. Your, your knife. You can chop the carrots, Simon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Julie. Really. And there you go, Liz. You can chop the celery. Great. Can you just cut the carrot a bit smaller? Yeah. Yeah, just a little bit smaller. Get the carrot. No, I'm gonna get the carrot. I'm gonna get the carrot. It's okay, you can both do the carrots. Julie, uh, do you want to just grab a saucepan from that cupboard and fill it with water? Thanks, Simon. I'll just cut these a bit smaller. What's next? Um, oh, we need a fry pan. Who wants to help cook? Me. I want to do it. I want to do it. I'm going to do it. I want to do it. That's okay. You can take turns. Have you been getting many shifts lately, Carl? Uh, yeah, I have. Actually, over on Dover Street. Ah, oh, Dover Street. I used to work there. Is Howard still the supervisor? Yeah, yeah. Um, manager Howard, sure. How long ago since you were there? Um, just before this job, so probably like two years. Right, okay. Yeah. Do you go back and visit? Okay, so what happened in that video? Um, so I just want to unpack some of the issues of the allocation and organisation that occurred which led to some of the problems that we saw in the video. So the first issue was that there was, that there was ineffective allocation of staff. So what we saw was that both support workers were working in the ki kitchen, providing support to three people for one activity. So what ended up happening then is that staff were working on the same activities rather than separate activities. So as you saw, you know, it, it, at times the male worker wasn't really doing too much. Uh, the female worker was doing more of the work um, and, you know, they were providing fairly uncoordinated support. In this scenario, um, both staff weren't really needed to be in the kitchen. This is a sort of a activity that one support worker can actually do quite well. So in services, staff support is, um, you know, the main thing that can be used to assist people so they're engaging in real and meaningful activities. In this scenario, it wasn't an effective use of both staff members. Um, so how that came about is to begin with, there was no real planning between the staff. Um, you know, they, they were providing uncoordinated support. So you saw in that example um, that one person, when the female worker um, advised the, the person chopping the carrots to cut it a bit smaller, the other, the male worker just sort of repeated it. Um, you know, he wasn't too clear on what he was meant to be doing um, in that scenario. And because, uh, you know, this was a group activity um, with both staff in there, as so you got five people in the kitchen, there wasn't a great deal of coordination between the support. And so because of it, and because it wasn't individualised, you saw extended moments of disengagement. So you saw at times the residents were watching the female work, the female worker uh, performing activities, you know, getting the things out of the fridge, uh, when she chopped the carrot and took over the activity, and also when towards the end there, when she got the fry pan out. Um, you saw extended moments of disengagement with the person near the sink. She was disengaged and did not actually want to cook. And as I said before, there's not really enough opportunities here in this activity for all people to be uh, frequently engaged. There were also missed opportunities. Um, there was a missed opportunity to provide effective assistance uh, for the person that was cutting the carrot and needed sort of extra assistance to know which size to cut them. 
Uh, you saw that the person that came into the kitchen who had something in his hand, he was not acknowledged uh, because the staff uh, were busy with this sort of group activity. Um, and, you know, there were missed opportunities for the people being supported to be more involved and engaged in what was happening. And as you saw towards the end, uh, you know, there was a conversation that broke out between the two staff with the residents just observing. So they weren't really participating uh, in what happened towards uh, the end of that support. So now I want to show what happens when the key elements of allocating and organising are in place. Do you want to support Simon with the cooking tonight? Yeah, I can do that. Great. Um, he said he wants to cook for everyone and he's chosen spaghetti bolognese. Great. Okay. <laughs> Liz loves cooking as well, so mm -hmm. she might join in. Yep. Um, Julie has to fill in a form, so I will assist her with that. Okay. And I also need to remember Dan likes to just be alone when he comes home. Sure. Okay, great. Okay, now see this one here. This piece is the perfect size. Okay, do you reckon you can chop the rest that size? Yes. Yeah. Okay. This size? Good work, my man. Yeah. Uh, Liz, could I get you to grab a big pot from down there and fill it with water? Uh, we're going to need it to cook the pasta. Okay, great. So this is a form to get a concession card for public transport, like trains and buses and things like that. So there's a couple of questions like where you live and what your name is. So I think let's just start here with your name. There you go. Oh, hey, Dan. What have you got there? Party. Oh, party. How exciting. It says Andrew's 21st birthday and he needs to know whether you're going to make it. Yes. All right. Uh, I'll finish up with Julie, then I'll come see you. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. See you soon. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Great. Okay. Now, Simon, um, some of these are going to need to be a little bit smaller so they can cook. Here, I'll show you how to cut them a little bit smaller. Uh, okay. There we go. Do you want to keep going with these other pieces? Yes. <laughs> Great work, mate. Oh, thanks, Liz. Uh, now, we're doing really well. I reckon the next thing to do is grab the pasta and the tomatoes and the pasta sauce out of the cupboard up there, please. Thank you. Julie's finished her form. Do you need any help? Uh, no, I think we're on top of it. Um, Simon's doing a great job chopping up all the veggies and we're just about to start cooking. Cool. I'll just check in on Dan. Sure. Cool. Okay, so what we saw in that scenario really contrasts what we saw in the, uh, the poor shift planning video. So instead, this time we saw that the staff planned before the shift, so they worked out the key activities that would happen and who will be responsible for them. One of the things to note is that the female worker out of the two was actually the more experienced and she led the conversation. The male worker in con was somewhat of a casual worker or someone who didn't work there to, uh, particularly regularly. So, you know, it was required the female worker who works there regularly to sort of lead this shift planning conversation. So there was a bit of an understanding of, you know, who was going to be responsible for which key activities. Uh, the other thing that you saw was that the male worker read the shift plan before uh, the shift, they started providing support so that he understood what was likely to happen, the support that people needed and wanted. Uh, another key difference was there was uh, allocation to different areas of activities. So in that video, we saw that the male worker was in the kitchen providing support with cooking, uh, whereas the female worker was supporting a resident to complete a form at the dining table. So what this allocation allows for is much more individualised support. You saw that the female worker was providing one-to-one -one support to, to one person, and it also meant that the male worker was providing one-to-two support. So this meant that the people being supported received the support how they wanted and needed it. Um, for instance, you saw that the, this time around that the person who was cutting the carrots actually got that assistance and that instruction in how to uh, cut the carrot and got that instruction so that he could perform the activity. Um, you saw in this time around that the female resident who last time was up the back and didn't want to be cooking was actually supported to complete a form. Um, you know, this is what she actually wanted to be doing. And the other thing you saw is that 
um, the male resident that comes into the kitchen is acknowledged and he's not missed this time. Um, also, as part of good shift planning, towards the end, you saw that the staff updated each other what was happening. So this meant that the staff were aware of where they were up to and that no one was missed because the female worker then says that she'll go and check in with Dan. Um, yeah, so that's sort of the elements of seeing good shift planning in practice and what it sort of uh, leads to better support for the people uh, in the service so they get the support they need and want. So the question for frontline practice leaders is, well, how can you ensure there's good shift planning in a service? So first, uh, it's about having shift plans that are written and up to date. Um, so, you know, in order to get the shift plans written, um, the practice leader can write them themselves. They can have staff who are really knowledgeable about the service and particular shifts to write them. And then once they're written, they need to be reviewed regularly and have staff update the information regularly. Uh, I know from uh, the study that we do into practice leadership that uh, often they get written shift plans and then you know they sort of don't get updated along the way and so they sort of have a little bit of outdated information. So they kind of need to be constantly updated so that when staff come into the service, they're kind of learning you know, what actually is going to happen on shift, what is the best way to support the people uh, who live in the service. The other thing for frontline practice leaders is to ensure that shift plans are communicating the right information. So really paying attention to uh, what message does the language convey about the people supported and how staff should work. Really, they should focus on the people who receive the support first and then the staff task. So this is sort of having a bit more of a person-centred uh, approach into of how they're written and the language rather than staff centered. You know, shift plan shouldn't be about what staff need to do and all the admin and key tasks that they've got to perform. They should really be telling the people that work there, uh, you know, what are the people who receive support do each day? What are the things they like to do? What are their leisure activities? Uh, you know, what are their patterns of behavior? And then what's the support they need to live the life that they need and want? Um, so on the website, there is a, example of a shift plan. So you can sort of see the language and the layout that will help to convey that it's about the people who receive the support and them getting the right support. The other thing that uh, frontline practice leaders can do is set the expectation that staff plan before and during shifts. So in order to do this, uh, one thing is they can be present when staff are having a handover, so observing this and um, you know, ensuring that they, that does happen regularly and that staff are talking about the key activities and there's that um, sort of knowing who's going to be responsible for what things. Um, to get this started though, frontline practice leaders may need to facilitate this conversation until staff become comfortable. And the third thing that practice leaders can do is make sure that the people you support have information about the day. So the first thing will be to determine, well, what is the best way for each individual to receive information? Is it good to have conversations with the people that you support? You know, just talking to them each day and each shift about, you know, what they want to do, what, are, you know, what time and uh, what's going to happen on that shift or to have pictured plans or timetables. And again, there's some examples on the website about what that looks like. And then to make sure that it happens, you know, it, may require that the, pra the practice leader observes staff planning with the people you support, um, making sure that if there is pictured plans or timetables that this contains current information. Um, the idea is that by making sure people have this information that they can have choice and control about what happens um, each day, when and how. Okay, so I want to move on to another task of practice leadership, and this one's observing staff, giving feedback, coaching and modelling. So by doing this task well, practice leaders help support workers to develop new skills, refine existing skills, reflect on their practice, receive new ideas and suggestions. I just want to sort of make note of the language that's used um, in the training about practice leadership. If you notice there, it's very much about helping and developing staff so they become better practitioners. And this is uh, quite intentional within the, um, you know, the, the writing about practice leadership. It's about supporting and developing, enhancing the skills of staff. It's, uh, it's not a 
a punitive model, model or a performance management model. It's much more, you know, helping people to get uh, better in providing support. So observing staff refers to directly watching staff provide support and interacting with a person. So it's, you know, it's purposely watching what's going on and paying attention to the support that uh, a staff member is providing. Uh, it's the best way to identify good practice and areas for improvement. There's no real substitute for, uh, you know, just really watching what's going on to sort of assess uh, the quality of that support and, um, you know, the support that a person is receiving. So what should practice leaders observe? Uh, they should be looking at what's happening in the moment. Um, you know, what is, what is the experience of the people being supported? Are they, being, are they engaging in a meaningful activity? Are they receiving good support? Are they enjoying, um, you know, what they're doing? Uh, you know, how are the staff communicating to them? And the other thing that they should observe is the quality of staff support. You know, how well are they using the four essentials of active support? Um, how well are they um, sort of engaging the person to successfully participate uh, in activity? So on the website, we provide a framework and questions to guide observations. Um, so there's also questions to think about and plan feedback. So after conducting an observation, there needs to be a step uh, before giving feedback about really processing what it is that as a practice leader, you're going to say to the support worker. To sort of practice doing this, uh, there's a video of someone providing real support. Uh, this is a really nice video. I really encourage you to watch it of a person um, being supported at a pool. Um, so you can watch that video, use the framework and questions on the website to guide your observation and then use the uh, uh, the questions on there to sort of plan the feedback that you will provide. So for this task of practice leadership, what I want to focus on is giving feedback. So um, feedback is, after conducting the observation, is really important for support workers. Uh, support workers rely on feedback to know how well they're performing and to get ideas about how they can improve their practice and reflect on their practice as well. So the idea is that providing feedback to staff that you'll motivate them um, to provide good support and for them to recognize where they've performed well so that they keep doing it. Um, so in this next video, I'm going to show uh, poor feedback and what it looks like. So, um, you know, receiving feedback for staff uh, can make them feel uncomfortable. So it's really important that it's done well so that they be uh, you know, so they actually look forward to getting this feedback. So I'll play the video on poor feedback. How are you going, Fred? Good. Good? Yeah. Do you think you've done enough or do you want to do some more? No, 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 I'm finished. You're finished? Excellent. That's great. Nice work, Hayley. That looks great too. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Do you have time for a quick chat? Yeah, sure. Everyone be okay without me for a minute? Yeah. All right. Okay. Bye. All right, I'll be back soon. Okay. Uh, there are a couple of observations that I wanted to talk to you about. First, I think you could have set up the activity better. It seemed a little stop-start because you didn't have the equipment ready. If you plan ahead, get the equipment ready in advance, then people won't be waiting around so much. So can you do that next time? Actually, that is something I would normally do. Today didn't exactly go to plan, so I just didn't get a chance to set up. The other thing I noticed is that there are a number of missed opportunities to provide people with choice. Like when you asked Haley to choose a colour, you only offered her one. You said, do you want purple? And she chose purple, but no other option was provided. So why'd you offer just one colour? Well, I was going to offer her a range of different colours, but she chose purple straight away. So. Well, in that case, what you should have done is made it clearer to Haley that there are a few options available. First, shown her the colours and then asked, which one would you like? Okay. Yeah, look, I, I could have done that. But overall, you did a good job today. Thanks. All right, so what did the practice leader do wrong when providing feedback in that scenario? So firstly, the practice leader began by focusing on the negatives and areas to improve. So obviously, for the support worker, that was her just sort of hearing quite a lot of critical feedback. So um, I guess for the support worker, it's 
they're not going to be very comfortable if that's the feedback they're receiving regularly and they're probably not going to look forward to being observed and receiving feedback. Uh, the other thing that the frontline practice leader did was use mostly closed ended and why questions. So in using this way of speaking to the support worker, it didn't really encourage any conversation or an opportunity for the support worker to reflect on her practice. Uh, by asking why questions, you know, what you saw was that the support worker felt she had to keep justifying what she did and provide an explanation that was um, suitable for the support worker. Uh, the other thing that was missing from that feedback is it didn't provide the support worker with an opportunity to speak about her perspective, about uh, how she thought of the support or what happened in that scenario. And uh, in contrast to the real purpose of this task, it was critical of the support worker's practice. It didn't have that developmental quality that's meant to be within um, you know, observation and feedback. So this time I just want to show what good feedback looks like. How are you going, Fred? Good. Good? Yeah. Do you think you've done enough or do you want to do some more? No, uh, no, no, I'm finished. You're finished? Excellent. That's great. Nice work, Hayley. That looks great too. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Do you have time for a quick chat? Yeah, sure. Everyone be okay without me for a minute? Yeah. All right. Okay. Fine. All right, I'll be back soon. Okay, what do you think that went? All right, today hasn't exactly gone to plan, but we are managing, the paintings are coming along well, so. What do you think of the support you provided? At times I felt like I was doing too much for Hayley, like I was actually painting for her rather than just supporting her. Well, one thing I noticed is that your communication was clear and effective. You used a range of different communication methods, uh, verbal, pointing and using objects. Mm -hmm. I think it was clear to everyone what you're communicating to them. But for instance, when you showed Dallas the colours and then pointed to the painting, that helped Dallas choose the colour he wanted. Now, you mentioned that you thought you were helping Hayley too much. Can you explain that some more? Yeah, like I said, I felt like I was actually painting for her, like I was taking over. Oh, it's good that you noticed that. What would be a more effective way of supporting Hayley? Well, I, I could use hand over hand assistance. Um, well, maybe I could just take the time to slow down and show what to do. Well, that's something you can try next time. Providing graded assistance is a skill, but it's one you can develop. From what I've observed over the last month, you're getting better at it. Okay, thanks. Now, I've noticed something. After Joe painted for about 30 minutes, she just stopped and started talking about other things. Yeah, she actually does that most sessions. Okay, but what do you think that means? I don't know. I think maybe she just gets distracted. Well, it looked to me like she wanted a break. That after 30 minutes of painting, she needed a rest. Okay, yeah, look, maybe you're right. Maybe she does need a break. Well, if that's the case, what can you do? Maybe I could just give her a rest, you know, rather than try and redirect her back to the activity straight away. Or I could meet her where she's at, you know, have a little chit chat with her about the topic she's brought up. Maybe after that little break, she'll want to go back to the painting. Yeah, great, little and often. Letting Joe have a break and then returning to painting when she's ready. Mm. Could be an opportunity for her to have a chat with you or potentially the rest of the group. Okay, well, I'll give that a try. Well, keep working on the graded assistance and keep up the good work. Okay, thanks, Sebastian. All right, so I think we see a real contrast in the way in which the practice leader provided the feedback in both those scenarios. And there's a real contrast in the tone um, of the feedback and also the experience for the support worker. So I just want to, again, just unpack how that feedback occurred and some of the ways in which the practice leader managed that feedback. So the first thing that the practice leader did was found out the support worker's point of view. So starting with an open-ended question, how do you think that went and what do you think of the support you provided? Uh, starting with that is quite intentional because um, for support workers, they usually have a pretty good idea of, you know, how that support went or even some of the issues that they, uh, that occurred during um, providing support. So the idea is that you start with where they're at and find out their perspective. The other thing is by starting, um, you know, with the things that they've identified is that the support worker then can start working with the ways in which they were thinking about their their practice and start working on reflective practice. 
Um, the other things that the frontline practice leader did was to begin by identifying the positives. So, and giving a real example that the support worker provided effective communication. So this reinforces what the person did well. And also if feedback is something new for the support worker, um, you know, having feedback sessions which really focus on the positives rather than the critical would mean that in future support workers are going to be much more receptive and look forward to uh, having feedback uh, with the practice leader. The other things that the practice leader did was uh, he was quite specific in using examples about what happened and the support provided, you know, really getting into the detail so that, again, um, sort of reinforces what the person did well. The practice leader encouraged reflection. So by inviting the support worker to speak about the issues she raised. So if you saw, he asked it another open-ended question, you know, what could be more effective way of supporting Haley? So this gave, the, I mean, this gave the support worker an opportunity to problem solve, you know, to work through it uh, for herself and identify ways in which she thinks she could um, provide better support. And the frontline practice leader used the language of active support, things like grade assistance and little often. So this reinforced expectations about the support that's provided. The other thing which you saw towards the end there is that it was only, you know, near the ending of that conversation that you saw the practice leader um, gave the support worker any ideas or concrete examples about how to do things differently. Um, for instance, he gave the advice around Joe, who was painting and wanted to stop for a chat. So he used his own perspective or understanding of conducting that observation about what he thought would be useful next time that um, the support worker provides support. So he was drawing on his knowledge and own expertise and sort of um, trying to develop the skills of the support worker in that situation. And as you saw, the feedback was timely, it was given as close to the event as possible. So by observing staff and giving feedback, frontline practice leaders can help staff to further develop their practice. Um, so as I said before, it's through observation, that's one of the best ways of finding out how well staff are providing support, but then using that knowledge and information gained to then provide staff with feedback so that they can um, find ways to further develop. So in the moment of providing support, staff don't always sort of know uh, you know, what was going on or what happened. And then by being an observer to this, you can sort of help them to sort of identify and see another perspective of the support they were providing. Um, you know, for staff, it, they can be uncomfortable uh, with receiving the support, uh, feedback, but if it's delivered in a positive and respectful way, then staff will be more receptive to it, even if it's critical of their practice. Um, so providing feedback for practice leaders isn't easy as well. It's actually quite challenging um, to provide feedback. Uh, you know, when learning about feedback, it's usually the feedback in the, the poor um, scenario is what, what happens because, you know, just trying to think the idea is to sort of uh, correct things or fix things um, by sort of pointing out what they did wrong and what they could do um, is actually what many practice leaders do when they sort of first start out giving feedback, but uh, by sort of working through those steps provided about providing good feedback, um, you know, it's sort of the path providing more effective feedback, but also this will be learnt and refined through practice um, providing feedback. Okay, so I want to move on to the next task, and this is about supervising the practice of each staff member. So supervision is probably something that most people are familiar with. It's the idea of a practice leader and support worker having a deep and focused discussion about the support worker's practice. Um, the idea within practice leadership is that supervision is to use to guide and develop the support worker's practice. So often in services, uh, people have supervision, you know, the idea of sort of supervisor sitting with the support worker, but um, it's not unusual to find that those conversations are about things like um, you know, how are you going working with other staff members? Uh, do you have leave coming up and all that sort of stuff? But within practice leadership, it's really about talking about practice and quality of life. So there are different types of supervision. Uh, as you can see there, there's, there's four types um, presented using this uh, quadrant. The two that I most want to focus on is planned formal supervision. So this is probably the type of supervision that most people have in mind of, um, you know, 
supervision is planned in advance so that both the support worker and the staff member know that supervision is happening soon, coming up next week or something like that, occurs on a regular basis, like monthly or six weekly, and it follows a structured agenda. So they know in advance the topics are going to be discussed. The other type of supervision that I want to talk about is unplanned and informal. So this instead occurs on an, odd hack, uh, on an ad hoc basis. So it might be that uh, the supervisor and the support worker just take an opportunity uh, during a shift to have a conversation. You know, they might catch each other in passing or it might just be a bit quiet or something like that and they will have uh, a supervision type conversation where it is about the support worker's practice. Uh, again, this is different to having a planned formal supervision in that it, there is no agenda. It's unstructured, it's flexible, they can talk about issues that are coming to hand. So the idea of uh, being aware of different types of supervision is recognising which one you're using the most and what could be the benefits of using another type of supervision. So as I said, within practice leadership, the idea of planned formal supervision is that uh, together with the staff member that you review the staff member's performance, you acknowledge good active support, um, that you're encouraging staff to think critically and reflect on their practice and help staff to identify areas of practice for improvement. So what we've found uh, conducting the longitudinal study into frontline practice leadership is that practice actually isn't something that's um, one of the main topics of discussion, it's those other things that I mentioned. So the idea is that within practice leadership, this should be really what the majority of the supervision is about, really focusing on the staff members' practice, encouraging critical reflection, um, helping them think about ways in which they provide support in the past or thinking about how they're going to provide support in the future. Um, so in terms of conducting effective supervision, there's really two key elements to it and that's about how well the frontline practice leader asks questions and their listening skills. So in this next video we're going to see how a supervisor uses the skills of asking questions and listening in an informal unplanned supervision. Hey, Michael. Oh, hey, Janine. Hey, a shift has come up on Thursday morning. Would you like to take it? Yeah, sure, I can do that. Great. Hey. Oh, well, I think of it. Yeah. Do you have a couple of minutes? Yeah, sure. What's up? Um, I wanted to know how you were going supporting Paul at Lawn Bowls. Yeah, it's great. Uh, we've been going once a week now for the past eight weeks, mm -hmm. and he's really enjoying it. But um, there is something I wanted to talk to you about. What's that? Well, the reason he wants to go to Lawn Bowls is because he wants to meet new people, make new friends. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't seem to be working at the moment. Oh, how so? Well, people that are friendly enough, they know who he is and say hi. Mm -hmm. But the conversation kind of ends there. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe they don't know him well enough? What should I do? Do I let him work at his own pace or do I jump in a little bit more? Okay, so what you're saying is, how can you support Paul in social interaction? Mm, yeah, yeah. Well, can you tell me exactly what happens when you get to lawn bowls? We turn up and say hello to everyone, like I said. Mm -hmm. Then we find out what green he's on and I help him set up and then leave him to it. But I'll check back in if he needs any help. Okay, you're doing a great job, but perhaps now you need to give him a hand to facilitate conversations and keep them going if necessary. Yeah, yeah. Is there anyone there that Paul seems to get along with better? Yeah, there's this one guy. Uh, he always comes up and says hi in between games. Okay, well, if this person's already making an effort, then it seems that there's a potential for a conversation. So perhaps you could talk about how Paul bowled for the day, maybe he's won a game, and that could be the conversation starter. And then, like you said, you hang back, and if he needs help to keep the conversation going, then you're there. Okay, I can do that, yeah. Okay, great. When do you go bowling next? Saturday. Great, well, let me know how it goes, and thank you for doing that shift on Thursday. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. All right, so in that scenario, we saw an example of informal and unplanned supervision. So you sort of see how they're in passing and the practice leader sort of recognises this is an opportunity for an in-depth conversation with the support worker about his practice. But what I want to mostly focus on is the skills that were used by the practice leader to uh, have that conversation with the staff member about their practice. So what we saw was that the practice leader asked open-ended questions, 
um, such as, you know, how are you going supporting Paul at Lawn Bowls and how so? So these are questions which are useful for gathering information and generating discussion. The practice leader listened actively, you know, she gave her full attention, gave nods, said aha, uh -huh. and also she summarised the topic um, to make sure that she correctly understood and to move the conversation forward. So what you saw was, she said, so what you're saying is, and then um, sort of gave a bit of a summary. Um, the supervisor also listened openly, um, you know, allowed the support worker to describe the problem uh, fully, uh, you know, can you tell me what happens when you get to warm bowls? And then towards the end, what we saw was together they problem solved. And it was only right at the end, once the practice leader fully understood the problem that you saw that she shared her knowledge and gave a suggestion uh, to the support worker about uh, what he could do next time. All right, so I won't introduce team meetings too much. I think everyone knows what they're about. But within practice leadership, the idea is that you're focusing on the quality of life of each person you support and you're sharing information about practice. So uh, here's sharing a team meeting. Alrighty then, let's focus on Sam. Uh, what household tasks has he been doing this past month? Well, he's been doing his own laundry, mm -hmm. uh, collecting the mail and stacking the dishwasher. Great. I also supported him to clean the bathroom. He mopped the floor. I pointed where to mop and um, gave him some encouragement and he did most of the floor. Great, all right. Well, then I think you guys should definitely continue with that and we'll review it next meeting. Good. Now, Soph, you've been supporting Sam to make his own breakfast, yeah? Would you share with everyone how that's going? Sure. So for the past month when I've been working the morning shift, I've been supporting Sam in making his own breakfast instead of making it for him. So he gets to choose what he wants and I've just been getting him more involved in that process. Great. So would you be able to describe you know, how he makes it, you know, how he chooses it, um, and then what you're doing to support him? Well, it's been a gradual process. I um, started giving him some breakfast options, um, cereals or different spreads, and he chooses the one he wants by touching it. And then I was encouraging him to pour some cereal into a bowl or put some bread in the toaster. So I sort of built it up gradually from there. He gets to choose what he wants to eat, and I think he really likes that. How are you managing to do this? <laughs> it's so busy in the mornings. How do you find the time? Well, I was already spending the time making his breakfast anyway. It didn't take much longer because the process built up gradually. I've just swapped things around in the morning to make it more manageable. Great. So look, I think that Sophie's doing a really great job. Like she's set it up really well. So I'd love to see everyone starting to support Sam to make his own breakfast soon. And I hear you, like it will take a little bit longer. So that means that you don't get all your tasks done in the morning, you know, it's okay. Just make sure that you let the other workers know, yeah? So if, would you please update the shift plans, put in the information about how to support Sam with his breakfast and how you manage the morning and send it to me, I'll review it. And then we can all start supporting Sam to make his breakfast. Sure. Great. So let's talk about what he's been doing in the community. How have you been supporting him? Well, we've been going swimming once a week. He's really enjoying that. Yeah? Yeah, he, he never wants to come out. <laughs> <laughs> I do think there's an opportunity to uh, find another activity he might also like doing. All right, so what do you think he might like to do? Em, can we start with you? I think that he enjoys doing things that are either outdoors or allow him to be energetic. So I'm thinking he might like to go for a walk in the park or along the beach. Yeah, something where he can be active, I think. Okay. I think he can manage a trike and I can bring a bike in from home and we can give it a go. Okay. There's a um, trampoline park not far from here. I think you'd really like that. Okay, great. Excellent ideas. Who'd like to take the lead and follow these up? I can do that. Thank you, Robert. Why don't you find out where the activity is and what's involved and update the diary so that all the staff know. And then at the next meeting, we can review how it went. Okay, great. Good? Okay, so, Gavin. Okay, so you sort of saw in that video how they sort of raised the issue of providing active support to someone in the morning and how you get the time. And well, the idea is that the main support worker that was doing that realized that probably in the morning she was doing things which weren't all that important and actually more important was providing support so the person was engaged in a meaningful activity of making their own breakfast 
And then you sort of saw that person say, you know, how do you get the time to do that? And it's sort of moving things around so that the, you know, you're prioritizing the most important things. And then the practice leaders set this expectation that everyone does this now. And it's okay if things sort of, you know, all the other things that we previously before um, don't get done. All right. So I'm pretty much going to wrap up there and sort of just uh, we'll overlook the last few slides. But I think the main point I kind of want to finish on is sort of saying that, um, you know, to do practice leadership well, it does take sort of focusing on quality of life, focusing on staff support, having these conversations with staff and having the skills to do um, practice leadership, that it really is a skilled role in terms of having these conversations with staff and helping staff to recognise the importance of quality of life and then um, you know, sharing your knowledge and expertise with staff so that they get the skills and providing good support and also encouraging them to reflect on their own support. Thank you, Lincoln. You've done a wonderful job. Um, <coughs> and there was one question that came up um, through this that maybe um, more people are interested in, and, and that is, how long do you think it would take for somebody to work through the whole program? Um, I, don't, I don't think it's terribly long. I think you could, um, <laughs> I don't know, a day or two, two days. But I suppose the other issue is because it's modular, you can actually do it in, in a way that suits your needs from the point of view of, we talk about having individualised support. It's also a resource that I know with our other resources that people can use in a way that they maybe do a module and then come back and do it and do the next one a few days later or a week later or they do it with somebody else, all of those sorts of issues. So I think the flexibility is really important for people to acknowledge and to be aware of. Excellent. Yeah. It can be used, I mean, it, it can be used as a discussion in team meetings. So you can work through a module at a time as a group or trainers in organizations can take the material and and use it in the way that lincoln's used it this afternoon as a sort of presentation and then send people off to do some it's got exercises as it goes through so the answer is how long does it take it really depends how you are engaging with it uh, and in, in what depth so it's designed you can flick across it all or you can spend a long time talking about it and really developing and practicing those skills so Jacinta, can I just, I just want to round up by saying, you know, a huge thank you to Unison Disability Services that, you know, where we did all of the filming and we sort of dominated their lives for, for a week. And thank you to all the staff and to particularly Kathy Gauchi who organised um, all of the filming and to Maitri who did that, that filming. I mean, this has been a really collective effort from a lot of people. Uh, and we, we need to acknowledge, I think, all of those people that have been involved. Um, and it's funded by the NDIS Quality and Safeguarding Commission, and, and it's now available, it's online, it's free for people to use and, and make what they want of it. If people have got feedback and suggestions, then we're more than happy to take those on too. Excellent, yeah. I think you can feel that collaborative approach in the sense of the production of it, because it really is, an, is such a such a sort of complex piece of work that brings it together in a really nice, simple way. And I think Lincoln, you led us through it um, beautifully from that point of view. So yeah, we're pretty close. Yeah, we're 501. We've done excellently in the sense that I think we've got closure. As is always the case, the slides will be available um, on, we're on our website and as Chris said, feedback is always welcome. Feedback's welcome about the seminars and how we run them and feedback is always welcome about content. And Chris, I can and see you wanting to say something. <laughs> and I've just forgotten because David reminded me. Um, so, and the recording will also be available on our website. And the next seminar uh, will be on the second Wednesday in June. And it will be focusing on aging people uh, with intellectual disabilities and the response of, of policy and service systems. And we will have a, a guest from the US, uh, Professor Michelle Putnam, who's been working in disability and ageing for, for a long time. And uh, our very own Tao Ariton Bergman will be presenting um, a, 
the research that she's done more recently on the NDIS and ageing, and we'll be launching the Handbook of Ageing and Disability that was published uh, a month or so ago that's edited by myself and Michelle. So it should be a really good session next time too. So we'll look forward to seeing people then. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.